Hello, welcome to CPP Chat, a sometimes weekly look at what's going on in the world of C++, chatting with guests from the community. Uh, before we get started with this week's guest, we need to yield for a disclaimer. Thank you, Phil. Uh, this week's disclaimer is, you expressly agree that the use of this website is done at your own risk. The information published on this website is for informational purposes only. Any reliance you place on such, you do at your own risk. You understand that while great care is taken to provide you with the best possible information, possible, CPP Chat Company makes no representations or warranties of any kind express or implied about the reliability, accuracy, completeness, security, or currency of the information provided. I think I misread that, but uh, that'll just have to do. <laughs> I think you just need to resume now. That's right. Oh, no. Uh, I think we are going to be plagued with uh, coroutine puns. I'm sure you've never heard any of those, have you, Gore? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I heard. You've heard some, have you? <laughs> yes. Well, actually, I I heard a very nice uh, name for the C plus plus twenty on one of the Russians' forums. It is uh, let's see, Kokomora. Uh, concepts, coroutine, modules, ranges. Kokomora. <laughs> That's sure another. Sure, we yeah. can get another co from Concepts for in there as well. That's right, Kokomora. <laughs> Um, so our, our guest is uh, uh, Gore. Uh, am I getting your name right? Nashanov? Yes, Gore. Yes, Gore, Gore. Nashanov. Everybody knows Gore. Okay. Uh, so Gore is the architect for the coroutines that just got voted into uh, the, the standard document in Kona. So just a few weeks ago. Uh, congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Because I know that was a long time coming. Uh, when did you write your first paper on this? Uh, in 2014, but before me, there were two years of earlier proposals. So essentially, the first coroutines appeared in 2012 in the mailing. But okay. uh, whatever currently resembles the current TS uh, appeared in 2014. Okay. So I think uh, because this is something that's been discussed a lot, probably everybody has some concept of what coroutines is. But can you let us know? At a very high level, completely unrelated to C++ or unrelated to your particular proposal, what's a coroutine? What does that mean? How is that different from a routine? Well, it's just a better routine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is essentially how Knuth defined it, that uh, a regular subroutine is just a special case of a more general contract, uh, construct, a coroutine. So normal function, uh, it has essentially two operations you can do with it. You can call it. And it activates the function uh, when it reaches the end, it returns back, right? So you have call and return. Right. Uh, where a coroutine. So that's a is, sub routine. In other words, yeah, it's, it's a, a sub, sub of some other routine. Yes. Some routine is calling it, and its lifetime yes. is exactly and completely subsumed by the by the call right. routine. Right. Right. And uh, and coroutine just gets two more extra operation in addition to call and resume. Uh, sorry, call and return like normal function, it gets also suspend and resume. So suspend allows you to uh, yield control back, for example, to the caller right. before uh, completion of the function. And then right. there is some way to resume the function later. And uh, yeah. So in this sense, the co means that it's not subordinated to, to the routine that's calling it. It's a co-routine. It is a routine that can be called and then returned from and then called back into. Its lifetime is not necessarily less than the calling routine. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think coroutine first appeared uh, in paper by M M Melvin Conway in, in 10 years before Knut defined coroutine. So I guess the name coroutine is uh, Conway's. Not, uh, okay. <laughs> Knut, but anyway. All right. So... Um, so before we get into your particular proposal, uh, we, we want to do a roundup of what's going on in the world, including uh, talking about uh, events that are coming up and things like that, right? Um, so do we have any news related to any of the particular conferences? ACCU uh, registration is open. It's going to be 10th through 13th in April. Uh, MBO++, the Embedded C++ conference, is in March 14th through 17th. Oh, that's this, this week. week. That's this week, okay. Um, and uh, C++ Now, we have, in fact, notified submitters about which sessions have been submitted. If you're absolutely dying 
to get a list of submissions, you can contact me. I'll let you know. But the schedule itself is not up because we're still in the process of, uh, you know, step one is knowing what we're going to schedule, and step two is figuring out where everything is. So that's kind of we're between those two steps right now. Um, uh, let's see what else is going on. Oh, um, after C++ Now is Co C++ Tel Aviv. They have their schedule already up online. We'll have that in the show notes so that you can look and see uh, what they're doing. Um, and then the Italian one, again, is in June with uh, Andre Alexandrescu keynoting that. Um, and then we have some articles. Do you uh, do you want to talk a little bit about these articles, Phil? Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, I haven't read through these in detail. I saw them on uh, Reddit and, and scanned through. They looked interesting enough to um, to mention, particularly because of their relevance to the, um, uh, the recent meeting at Kona. So the first one was... Um, from uh, Vector of Ball, that was uh, Colby Pike we mentioned last week, uh, talking about modules. Uh, looks like part of a new series, Understanding C++ Modules, and this is part one, Hello Modules and Module Units. And just from browsing through, this, I didn't go into it in too much depth, but it does seem like a really nice, clear breakdown of the terminology and the different components that make up the, the language of modules, um, and also going into to some of the, the misunderstandings around them. So I thought that's quite worthwhile. Yeah, so now's kind of a good time because yeah. when modules or any major feature is being discussed, there's enough changes. Some of them are cosmetic, but they make everything look different. Uh, and so, you know, before things get voted in, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth. Maybe you want to kind of tune that out because you don't want to waste, invest a lot in learning something that you know is going to change. But uh, uh, but now modules is voted in. It's unlikely that there's going to be any significant change in the next few meetings, and then it's going to be part of the standard. So now's the time if you want to jump in and start learning. So articles like this are really timely. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then the the second one, um, again, another feature that's been voted into C plus plus twenty, although a little while ago, but it's still still churning a bit actually, is uh, is about contracts. So this was a um, another post co generation with C plus plus contracts. What was interesting about this was not so much the the discussion of contracts themselves, but the fact that it mentions a branch of GCC that you can get on Compiler Explorer that does have contracts support uh, implemented. So you can follow the link from that. Well, just go to Compiler Explorer and uh, search through the, the GCC um, uh, versions available. And I think the first one at the moment is the one with contract support. So you can actually play with that now. The, um, the conclusion of the article, by the way, um, is looking at whether the, this particular compiler takes advantage of contracts to do any additional optimizations yet. And although it looks like it should have done, it uh, it wasn't able to um, to bear that out in the in the figures. So not sure how interesting that is at this point. What interested me was more the support for NGCC that you can get in Compiler Explorer. Right. Good on Matt for implementing those. He's got oh, a yeah. couple of different uh, flavors that are available online so you can try them out. It's incredible service to the community for people who are experimenting. You know, it's one thing with, uh, if you've got a library modification you want to do, or if you want a new library, put it in Boost, send it to people, that's fine. But if you actually want to do a language change, that's really hard to send that to someone and say, here, play with this. Mm -hmm. And so it's great that, uh, great that we can play with that on uh, on Compiler Explorer. Um, also, uh, I think I think this is an interesting thing because, it, I'm sorry, Gore, go ahead. Oh, I was just uh, going to say that I think with contracts, uh, probably we are going to see this uh, long maturity of contract implementation because I think everybody will start with just accepting the syntax and in certain runtime checks. And right. then the tooling will pick up, optimizer will st start removing redundant checks. So I think it is a feature that maybe immediately you will not start getting a payoff but as long as you start coding to that and start using them over time tooling and compilers will actually make it amazing right i think one of the really controversial things about about contracts has been what is the compiler allowed to assume about the optimizations it can make so for example if you turn off your preconditions so that they're not actually evaluated is it still okay for the compiler to assume that you tested it with that on so it can still make the assumption that all the things that you've specified have to be true are true? 
And that's very controversial because some people are saying, well, that's a no brainer. Of course, that's exactly what we want this for. And other people are saying that means we're shipping real software out there that's going to make assumptions that that aren't valid. And uh, so very controversial. And that may be a while before compilers completely implement this in interesting ways. On top of which, once they start to decide, OK, we understand the intent now, you still have to roll out those optimizations and figure out, OK, what are we going to do? Um, that's, yeah, this is going to be interesting to, to follow. I think, as Gore says, there's there's a lot coming on this one. And well, of course, you mentioned, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, uh, uh, just before Kona, we had the, um, the interview with uh, Bjorn Feller about contracts. And we, we touched on a lot of those controversial issues. So of course it was going to be debated in Kona. And uh, what did they do? They changed some of the names. Yeah. <laughs> um, they they hotly debated all week long and they could not, they couldn't come to consensus on anything except uh, some cosmetic terminology things, which um, probably were an improvement, which is why they were able to get consensus <laughs> on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's uh, probably a lot more that's coming here. Um, I also wanted to talk about an article, um, and this is from uh, PBS Studios, and it's based on the fact that Microsoft has open sourced the uh, the source to the Windows calculator. And there you go. All right. So first of all, very good on Microsoft for doing that. I think this is the trend that I'd like to see a lot more of. You know, um, I'm not some huge you know, free software advocate, all software has to be free. If you've got proprietary software, you have reasons to not make it open source. But here's a, here's an example of something that, you know, the key to Microsoft's success as an operating system is not how well the calculator runs. So if we make that open source and we detect bugs and we make improvements, or maybe somebody comes along and says, hey, I can make a completely better calculator, but I don't want to start from scratch. I'll take, you know, the, the open source version that Microsoft has and I'll add the cool features that I think are cool and either give that away or maybe even charge for that. But the point is, so yes, good on Microsoft uh, for making it public. And then good on PVS, because what PVS Studio does is they take open source stuff all the time and they run their tool. Of course, this is advertisement for the tool, but there's a couple of things that come out of this. One is there's bugs detected. And PVS, every time they do this, the question keeps coming up. Say, so, well, wait a minute. Are you reporting all these bugs? Yes. Every time they do this, they report the bugs they find. Um, but the other thing is, it teaches us, this is why we read the article, it teaches us these are the kinds of bugs that real world code, shipping code, code that's probably been reviewed, code lots of users, still somehow this bug has snuck through, that's educational for us. And I think one of the things to talk about is, I mean, this is the calculator app. I assume if other people are like me, now I don't use Windows, but I use the Microsoft calculator all, I mean, the Macintosh calculator all the time. I assume this has had millions of users, you know, hundreds of millions of operations, you would assume there's no possibility there's any bugs left. I mean, and it's not that complicated, right? It's just a calculator. And I don't want to deprecate the work that goes into that. But it's, you know, it's not a spreadsheet. It's not a word process, it's just a calculator. It should be simple, no bugs, right? And yet, of course, um, some of these bugs have been identified. And he even says in writing the article, one of the bugs looks like it was fixed between the time he began the article and the time he fixed, <laughs> finished the article, so we had to explain, nice. so, well, if you try to look this up, that bug won't be there anymore. But it was there, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so so I just think it's great. And kudos to Microsoft, kudos to PBS. There's just a few things um, I wanted to talk about. Uh, um, let's see, I took some notes here. And I think I think the big thing is that one of the commenters, and I don't know how to pronounce his, his username or screen name uh, on Reddit, De Corsi, perhaps something like that. One of the things he said is, you know, use of modern C++ would probably have uh, avoided all the bugs that were that, that he was talking about. And this is one of the things, you know, I, I worked at Microsoft many years ago, and it was during a period of time when there was this thrust on trustworthy computing, and there was lots of security stuff. And I, I suspect security is even more important now. You could ask Gore about that because he's at Microsoft now, but at that time they had uh, people who were going around the, com the the company and giving talks and examples of security issues. And I was really excited about this because if I can write more secure code, I'm all for that, right? So I went in and I was really disappointed because every single example they gave was something having to do with arrays or character pointers or something else that I would just never have used because the examples may have been from C++ code, 
and all the examples were real world code that you know someone at Microsoft had written and code reviewed and, and you know shipped that bug and then was later detected and documented. So they were all real world bugs and most of them were in C++ but but none of them, as I said, were involving the string class or the vector class or any of those kinds of things. So just using modern code would have avoided every single security problem that they talked about. And again, this is what this is what this Reddit user was talking about in terms of what was found um, in the calculator code. If we just use modern techniques, not just it's not using the modern language is enough. You have to you have to use it. You have to take advantage of the features that are there because everybody knows you can write really crappy code in in modern C++. Um, the other thing he, he wanted to, uh, one of the things that was pointed out was um, a bug where a, an exception class was derived from STD exception, mm -hmm. but it was derived privately instead of publicly. And this can make a difference, a big difference, because if you're trying to catch exceptions, you can catch based on base classes. If you throw an exception, you can do a, a catch based on a base class, but it has to be a public base class. And one of the interesting things about C++ is it was specifically designed so that if you change something from, if you change any access specifier, if you change something from public to private or back or forth, if, it com if, if your code continues to compile, it will still do the right, the, do the same thing it was doing. You won't introduce a bug. You may prevent it from compiling. You may have taken something that used to be public and now you make it private and now it won't compile. You might do that, but you will not change the behavior of the code because either, either it was able to get that function or it was not. And, it was, and C++ was designed that way on purpose. But there's one exception to that is, ironically enough, in exceptions. And that is if you take a, a private, a public base class of STD exception and you make it private, you will in fact change the behavior of the code because you might not catch that. And it won't, you won't catch that at compile time. Any other problems would catch at compile time. And I, uh, it's one of the interesting things to me about the language that, that, this, that this idea, first of all, that they were, Bjarne, when he was thinking about this and thinking about the difference between private and protected, he made it so that you couldn't introduce a runtime error by changing that. It's either, it either won't compile or it'll do exactly what it was doing before. And I think that's, that's a, that's a great idea for C++. Unfortunately, there's this one hole in that, and that has to do with, with catching of base classes. Um, which just which, goes by the to way, show that to catch an exception, you must think like an exception. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, this is why, the way, uh, another one of my soapboxes, you all know, I'm big on East Const. I'm big on using uh, sign numbers for quantities. My other soapbox, and I don't get on this one very much. And that is, I use struct everywhere. I never use class. Um, and part of the reason is because almost always when we use inheritance, we want it to be public inheritance. And whenever I have any public methods, I want to list them first in my class. So I always use struct. I, I never use class except in a template declaration. But 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 to declare a struct or a class, I always use struct. But I don't I don't preach on that one much. That's just my personal preference. And but but one of the reasons is it doesn't catch it doesn't cause this kind of bug. It makes this kind of bug less likely. Because how often do we actually use private inheritance? It's 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 unusual. Anyway, enough of my soapbox. Um, there's some interesting bugs. You should look at them. We'll put notes link to this in the in the uh, in the show notes. Do we have any other newsy stuff, or can we dive into uh, what Bjor is here to talk about? Yeah, I think we're a bit light on news this week because it's only a few days ago we did the last episode. Okay, all right. So um, you uh, you you got this voted in the standard. I hope you've had a little bit of time to rest and reflect on that. Um, now, what do we need to do? We need to educate people. What what what's the next step? Uh, we need to bring ecosystem. Uh, for coroutines and uh, get compilers in sync and, and get the implementations in, in, in major uh, three compilers. Mm -hmm. Because essentially coroutines came uh, naked just as a, as a language feature. So imagine if uh, in C++ 98, we would have templates, but we don't have a template standard library. Right, and right. everybody just develops some kind of 
some kind of library. So uh, we uh, did the language first uh, with the hope that community will figure out uh, awesome ways of using coroutines, and then we standardize the best. Because sometimes whatever libraries come from the committee uh, may, may not be the most, uh, you know, efficient one. Uh, at right. least initially, I, I'm thinking student sync and student future, right? So we don't want to standardize something that uh, we later discover it's not as good. So the idea was, we'll focus on the language, we will we'll, uh, work with the libraries, and uh, eventually we'll standardize the best version of task, the best version of generator uh, people developed. Uh, this, and also, this is, yeah. I was gonna say, this is a bit of a departure. Um, in the past, when when the standard first came out, it came out with uh, namespaces and the standard library used namespace. Of course, there wasn't much; just put it all in one namespace. Um, when this when the standard introduced um, uh, initializer lists, right? Well, the library, the same release that has initializer lists in the language, initializer lists are in the library. Um, we introduced no accept, and in the same release, no accept is in the library. So. Um, we've we've tended to do that. However, 20 looks like it's going to be some differences. Um, we're going to have concepts. We're going to have um, uh, modules. We're going to have, there may be some module support, very rudimentary module support. There's a lot of things that we're not going to see reflected in the library. Concepts, as I said, uh, contracts, um, some of these things that are not going to be in the library that are going to be in the language. And I think that's reality because we can't we can't nail the correct library until we've got the language feature, and we've been mostly lucky in the past that we were able to we were able to kind of keep those in sync. But I think with twenty, we're going to see some significant library language stuff that isn't going to be properly supported in the library, and so that's and in some cases it might be because it's just not easy to know exactly how to do it. Do you feel like you know how libraries should support it and we just haven't had time to get there? Or do you think it's still some open issues? Uh, I think it's both. Uh, I think over the last, what, five years, uh, we, we had coroutines implemented and we played with them. Uh, we, we roughly got the understanding uh, how it should work. But we have new features coming into the language in 23, uh, networking TS, executors, uh, and other fun stuff. So we would like to make sure all of them are a coherent uh, whole. Also, uh, we got the uh, concepts in, and that affects how how people specify in libraries and how we, how we uh, we are writing libraries. So uh, it feels like we may get into the you know TikTok like an Intel where they uh, reduce the size of the transistors and then do the architecture change within the same one and then they repeat that. So it looks like right now we jammed very late many important language features. Right. And there was no time to catch up because yeah. I think uh, uh, coroutines didn't change much, much since 2015. All right. So we did not vote them in 17. And hope was that immediately once 17 is shipped, we merge the coroutines and then we'll have an, an, uh, you know, three years to polish the library support. And uh, that didn't happen. And that didn't happen with modules as well. So uh, both modules and coroutines, they came very, very late to the deadline right. of, of the feature freeze. Right, right, right. But I'm thinking that uh, we can mitigate that by, I don't know, uh, having somewhere a public uh, coroutine starter pack like one header that gives you a generator task and a few other utilities you wish you had in the language. But, uh, and, and that might help, uh, help, uh, 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 well, help on, on both things. First, if we made a mistake and people in, in the library yeah. and people are playing with them, they will discover it, we can fix it. And second, uh, people can, immediately become productive with coroutines. They don't have to, because before we had any uh, publicly available coroutine libraries, uh, if somebody wants to use coroutines and they don't have already, say, existing runtime that deals with the synchrony, 
Well, right. they first have to come up with it. Right, right, right. It's and, very, uh, very hard to develop a library if you don't have the li the language support. Right. Right, right. So, so, uh, so how long are starter are, pack? Uh, even though twenty doesn't have any library support, people should be able to grab something and start working immediately. Right. Um, so, how long before you're going to announce the Boost uh, coroutine utilities uh, library to give people these uh, starter this starter pack? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's like <laughs> one header somewhere, uh, and hopefully, you know, better library people than me are working on it. But uh, well, you, you put it out there as a starting I point. Can put a starter and, uh, pack. I can I can create a starter pack. Yeah, uh, and let's and, get this submitted and in, we'll and then we'll get what, some. Uh, what will, what will come up out of it? I I, I right. noticed that I think Chris uh, Chris K put some coroutine support recently in Boost ASIO. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Well, so, maybe. Uh, Maybe there it's already there. I just don't know. There. About it. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's already there. Course, I don't know. Uh, boost uh, dot future dot then uh, that you can easily hook up coroutines to. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you know how many people use uh, boost future dot then? Well, it's it's really hard to get um, numbers about a part of the library. I mean, we can mm -hmm. give you some idea, but I don't know. I I can't yeah. I can't give it to you. But we know a little bit about how much it's used, which is very very extensively. You know, there's you yeah, know, I'm just curious so if users, if but... if uh, any of the listeners are using those then part of the boost future, it would be interesting to see. Uh, yeah, where it's used. So one of the things about your proposal that I think was was specifically called out as exemplary was that you had in 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 your paper, and I, I don't have the details here, but you called out and said this is what. Most users are going to see, and this is what a small number of users are going to see, and here's what a really small number of users are going to see. In other words, kind of the fundamental mm -hmm. library developers, the the library developers that will build on those fundamental types, and then what users are going to see. Oops, Phil will have to edit that out. <laughs> that hurricane sound that you just heard was my mistake. Sorry. Anyway. Um, uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about what what your thinking was there? You're, you're thinking there's uh, coroutines will be used by different people in different roles. Is that is that how you're well, thinking about uh, it? Well, if you look at JavaScript, Python, uh, you know, C Sharp, Dart, Hack, and a whole bunch of languages which acquired and Swift now, or at least all, very soon, they have very, very similar looking coroutines in terms of the syntax. So you have your two basic types, a generator and a task of some sort, right? And that's that's your happy face. That okay, hang on one second, because you've mentioned generators before. I think I know what they are, but let's make sure everybody knows. So a generator is a routine I'm going to call that may, for example, return prime numbers. So as long as I keep calling it, it generates the next prime number. Something like that. Uh, I don't like how you def defined it, but well, so, tell me, uh, tell me how I should so, think about uh, it. Then. I think that generator we will have uh, in, in in the standard library, it is a function that returns an iterable or an input view, view adapter or something like that. So essentially, okay. it's an, uh, let's temporarily forget about ranges, even though they are amazing. But uh, for those who are not familiar with them, I'll just talk in terms of. Pre twenty, so uh, iterable is a pair of begin and end, right? Okay. And uh, begin and end, you can plug them into standard algorithms. You can uh, use them with range base four and just play with them directly. So uh, generator uh, is just a function that returns you an iterable, and its implementation is a coroutine which yields values. So, so let's say generator of int f yield 42, yield 43, right? So that is a, a, a generator. Uh, but from the outside, you don't even know it's a generator uh, apart from the return type. Like you just know it has a begin and end. But it is implemented uh, as a coroutine. So essentially, your function looks like a function, but it's actually a state machine, and it's simply expressed as an imperative control flow. So your yields are the points where you actually give the value back. So, to, then... the, so to the caller, I'm, I'm calling, and I'm getting 
an object on which I call begin and end. That's the yes. return. Yes. So you, However, you, you, yeah, go ahead. when I call begin, I'm getting an iterator then that every time I do a plus plus, it's calling back into the coroutine, which yes. then does some calculation and says yield. Uh, yes. Or maybe it uh, reached the end. And when it reached the end, your uh, iterator will match uh, end iterator. Right. So. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, that is why I said that, well, it's not exactly that, you, that every time you call, you get the new value. No, you get uh, something that you already know how to deal with. It's just that uh, the iterator is smart. So it knows when you plus plus, it actually mm -hmm. resumes the coroutine and uh, it, it works for a while and eventually uh, it yields the value back or maybe it, it, it uh, runs through the completion. So a uh, generator is a very simple thing and it's very, easily integrates with the rest of the uh, standard library. OK, so that's the that's the generator side. And what's the alternative? The alternative is a, a Oh, yeah, uh, 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 alternative is uh, a, uh, a synchronous task, OK, uh, which uh, which could be pretty much it, it, could, it could return a, a suit future if you want to. But essentially, uh, the idea is that uh, you getting back some type which represents a value which is not there yet, like stood future or a boost future, right? It's it's this placeholder out of which you can eventually get the value. Right. That sounds and like a future. Yes. But it's different. You, well, and then it's just that similarly, like with generator, you implement it as a coroutine as opposed to a handcrafted state machine. Right. So it's that you 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 have a point in your function which says a weight on something. So for, for example, uh, some very, very simple function that says, uh, you know, future of T or future of void of G, uh, print something, then a weight on some computation that will eventually returns you five or, or, or whatever. And mm -hmm. then you uh, return that value plus one, for example. So uh, when you call this function G, as soon as it hits a weight, it returns back your future. So you have this future, and you actually have no idea that the function is still running. You don't know what is the implementation, because in C++, coroutine or not, it is an implementation detail of the function. You still work with the function from the outside like any other normal function. Whatever the contract of the function is, that's how you work with it. But normally, if you want to implement like a, an iterator for the complicated logic, you have to create a class and then, I mean, you have to do a state machine by hand. And mm -hmm. similarly, with asynchronous problems, uh, you have to do it by hand. And coroutines, they automate creation of that state machine for you. Because the, the function is only suspended. So the state of the function is maintained. The function yes. is your state machine. So I don't yes. have to write something that says, I'm going to return and I'm going to create a structure that has this information in it. Yep. Instead, I Compiler just have a function itself it yes. and I've declared things on the stack with whatever properties those have, including accessibility or whatever. And I, I just, I'm then suspending the function and that is the state machine, which is the natural way for C++ programmers to think about state yes. machines is it's a function at a certain stage right and it's interruptible and resumable at will by the caller or by where the no uh, it is i wouldn't say it's interruptible by the caller it's uh, it's more it's interruptible that, where yeah. the where the code has put in the suspend it is the author await. yeah it is author of the function which marks up the point where the function may may need to get suspended Right, but it's for, but it's the caller reason. then is resuming that. Um, somebody is resuming it. It depends on the scenario. Uh, say in the generator case, yeah. obviously the caller is resuming it, right? Because but not, but, some, but again, that's not, with a, there is a guy with an iterator, right. and it says plus plus. It keeps going, right? The reference reaches for the value and grabs it. So in that case, yes, it is. It is a caller. But if you are uh, doing some kind of asynchronous uh, operation, 
you are awaiting on a scene creed, for example, from Boost.io. Mm -hmm. And then it is your event loop. It's your thread pool. It is your completion routine from whatever facility you are using is the one which resumes your asynchronous uh, computation. So let me see if I get this right. Um, right now, I could call async and get a, a future. And then at some later point, I can call get. So let's say I'm doing some stuff, and now I want to print out an answer. And I say, and here the answer is future.get. And mm -hmm. I print that out. Um, and it is, it is possible that I block at that point. It is possible it's already completed, all these scenarios. But what the coroutine allows us to do is that in the implementation of what I've called, it could suspend and restart based not on me as the caller, but on some process that it spun off. So it could do some network process yes. that, it's, that it's spinning off. And I don't need to manage that at all because the code itself is saying, I'm going to await until this code is complete and then and then resume. So it is the author of that code is deciding when it's going to wait and what event it will trigger on. Is that how it works? Uh, yes. Yes. So uh, sometimes, uh, as I would correctly talked uh, before, yield, it's, uh, it's the guy who pulls the strings, directly controls it. And sometimes it's something external to the function. Uh, it is a synchronous event, a network card received a packet. So it triggers an inter interrupt. You know, it is delivered somewhere to some queue. Then somebody decues it and then uh, calls you back. And uh, and the callback actually resumes the coroutine. So uh, those are two most commonly occurring scenarios for coroutines. And we're going to have some nice uh, library support for those two. And we'll I, have more, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say we not only need library support, we need some best practices and patterns because it's just listening to it, I'm seeing all sorts of possibilities for resources to get spun off and never get cleaned up, uh, threads that 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 just magically are never continued and then they are just hanging there. Um, I'm sure that you've thought through all these scenarios. I'm not being critical. I'm sure that you've thought through them. But what I'm saying is that users need to be aware of the best practices and the pa patterns of how to use this, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because it's a new way of thinking about code, which, as you said, lots of languages have this, but it's not well, the way C++ um, plus has been done. If you already, for example, write asynchronous code, for example, you use boost as IO, and you write your code as a, a bunch of state machines that you write, mm -hmm. you're written yourself as um, as uh, classes, right, with uh, members representing the completions. Well, for those guys, uh, trans the transition will be uh, rather simple because you simply replace, I don't know, 50 lines of code with five lines of code, and the rest of, of it doesn't change. And if your code used to be work correctly before, then it will work correctly afterwards. I think the big uh, uh, difficult step is if you go from synchronous code to asynchronous code, then you have to learn how to deal with asynchrony in all of the incarnations. But if you're already there, uh, it is a simplification for you. But you don't have to write asynchronous code. You can just have fun with generators, and that's that's all you need to do. Uh, just recently, I saw some awesome example by Frank uh, Burr. Uh, well, Frank, I know his first name, but the Last name, I, 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 it's difficult to pronounce, Burbacher. Uh, he was playing around with a Stud Audio proposal, and he discovered that by using Generator, he can make the user-facing code much, much simpler when you want to play a melody. Before, it was much more complicated state machine they have to write. So uh, applications of Generators, which are much simpler than asynchronous coroutines, uh, they are Quite, quite large, so people might be able just to, do, to to get by with generators. And then you don't have to think about all of that complexity uh, with regard to asynchronous computations. So are you seeing this? Again, um, as I said, you were kind of called out with great praise because of the way you presented your paper, talking about how coroutines will be used by different scenarios. Um, oh, I see. Sorry, sorry. We just jumped. I actually was going to reply to that part of your question, but then we moved away. Can I reply to it? 
Oh, please do, yes. Okay, 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 okay. So, uh, essentially, uh, because coroutine came as just a language feature, and I wanted to, for, the, for, for people who write libraries, to start playing with them, start experimenting, discover libraries. Uh, over the last five years, most of the presentations about coroutines were focusing on those low level details, right? How do we create new coroutine libraries? Essentially, it's like uh, how to do placement new, how to do funny sphenia tricks in your, in your uh, pair constructor or somewhere. So uh, that may have created an impression that coroutines are very, very complicated. But it was partially because I needed library writers to start playing with coroutines and discovering that they can do whatever they want with them. And uh, that is where we focused our uh, presentations about coroutines, right? But the, uh, the end user experience, we want it to be as good or better as any other language which has coroutines, right? So from the top, two million uh, plus developers, they will be using your generator and task, and that's it. So it, the experience will, will be very, very lightweight. And then if you want to go one level deeper. So hang, hang on one question. Yeah. I want to ask you that now. OK, so you've already talked about it, it, generators and tasks. Is that? going to be something that people will entirely write themselves, or do we need a generator library that they will work with, or a task library? Um, how? Yeah, absolutely. So we will have stud generator and stud task. I see, I see. Uh, OK. So people who don't have their own tasks, they can just use standard tasks, right? I see, I see. OK. And, and, then, uh, the and that's not part... in the library yet, but that's what you're envisioning. That's what. That's yes. the, the piece uh, that we, needs to have in there. Yes, okay. uh, right. I think we have a proposal. We can potentially standardize task for 20, but uh, maybe it makes sense to just pause it and let it uh, mature. Uh, Where the standard is concerned, I'm a patient person, and I would rather, yes. I'd rather us get it right than get it early. Yeah, so uh, generator and task that's given, you, you, you have them. Or if okay. you have your own uh, runtime already, and you have your own iAsync operation, whatever, the boost future, you can use that because Coroutines allows uh, plugging in into whatever asynchronous runtime you have. So that is a top layer. You just you don't do anything, you just use this C++ Coroutines in a very simple way comparable to uh, Python. Uh, next and, layer and, up, and the, uh, I, I Sorry, I keep interrupting. And the generator and task libraries that you're envisioning, are we just going to derive from that? This is just a base class that handles all the infrastructure, and there's just certain things we override. I, you, you don't need to uh, override anything. You just say, like, uh, let's go a, a generator. You just write generator of int f for yield 42. That's all. You don't need to uh, override anything. It's just a, it's just so a you're, type. So it's like you're passing the lambda into it. You, its body is a lambda you pass in. I mean, I'm not it's sure. It's the return not, type, isn't it? Yes. You, 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 are de, you are defining your function. You're saying it's a generator of integers. right? It returns your generator of integers. And generator, in this case, it's the standard library type with begin mm -hmm. and end, where people can play around, you know, plus, plus, et cetera. And then I in see. the body of the coroutine, you use the word yield keyword. Oh, so means, the magic is all in the return type. You just said this returns a generator of integers, and the function um, itself says at do this. Yes, at some approximation, you, you can think of this way. It's okay. that, that uh, you def you write your the body of your coroutine and you use yield for the two or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to the outside, you want the function just give you a, gen uh, a generator of int type, which is an iterable with begin and mm -hmm. end, right? Okay. So, so that's it. You don't need to. Yeah, I'm beginning anything. to see. Okay. All right. Uh, and then if you want to have an asynchronous task, for example, uh, you will return future of int if you're OK with overhead of the future. And then inside of the, your body, you are allowed to say await on something. And as soon as you say await, so as soon as the control flow reaches await, uh, well, it suspends. And you get a future, which is not yet fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And eventually, this thing completes, and then your future is 
is is ready. So this is the this is the two 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 million people level. Everybody, and that's like right. I will be using the coroutine that way because I. Why do I need to write the library? Sure, that sure, sure, sure. Good enough. Yeah. And same with vector. Like vector is good enough for most of the people, right? So they, yeah. they, they, we are using them. So next layer up is, let's say you're already using some uh, asynchronous tasks, maybe stood task, maybe boost future, whatever. And then there is a new awesome library which has async APIs, which are not yet coroutine aware. So the next layer of complexity is that you can learn how to describe asynchronous operations so that you can await on them. Because await can await on a struct. Like it, it's, it's, it's a very simple description, awaitable, which explains is the, the, is, is the operation completed? How to subscribe to a callback uh, when it completes? And what is the result of it? So you have to define that. So you just need to learn three uh, customization points and you can define how to await on anything. And awaiter could be a very, very uh, funny thing. Like it just could, could put the coroutine in a queue, and then when some scheduler decides that it's ready to go, it will dequeue and, and resume. So uh, it doesn't okay. have to involve any threads. It's just a struct that somebody puts into uh, intrusive list, and there okay. is no heap allocations either. So, so this is the second level. So the, talks that, the talks that I have seen on coroutines generally haven't been at this level. And that's kind of why I've been kind of confused because I didn't know how the magic was happening. I saw some really cool stuff that looked like, oh, wow, that's really cool. But now, um, so what you're saying is there's there's this keyword await or co-await, I guess. Uh, and yeah. it and it takes oh. it takes a type and that's going to be, well, isn't necessary oh, wait, for too many people. But for yeah. some people, I'll be able to write my own custom type. Yeah. And you said that type then has to have three member functions? Yeah. OK, wait, so three wait, member functions. Three, yeah, yes. And and those three member functions are uh, how I'm, how I, what are they? How I suspend you? Or can you be, what, what do I, what are those uh, three member uh, functions? Yeah, the first one is simply a question. Is the value ready already? OK. Like, do we actually need to suspend at all? Because okay, if okay. we don't use suspend, we just bypass it and just keep, keep going. OK. Another one, well, if we don't have the value, uh -huh. uh, here's the function object that you need to call when you have a value from me. And that essentially means, say, you, you have a C library. Right? So I'm essentially yeah. registering a callback with you. Exactly. You're the registering day, a callback. Are you ready yet? If you're not ready yeah. right now? Then I call you and say, when you are yes. ready, give me a call. Exactly. So, hey, please call me at this, you know, with, with this yeah. callback uh, when it's ready. And finally, is what is the result of the operation, right? Uh, like, if you do an async read, maybe the result is an expected of number of bytes returned or an error, or maybe it's just a number of bytes returned and an error is expressed as an exception thrown. So okay, that is what so, your third. So with the callback, yeah. the callback doesn't give me the value. The callback just tells me now you can ask me the value. Uh, so, the, so the third thing is give me the value. So yes. if I call the first one, I just say, is it ready? If it is, I then call the third one directly. If it's yeah. not, I call the second one and say, let me know when I can call the third one. Yes, and I, in this case, is a compiler that did a coroutine body transformation because okay. it's a compiler which asks uh, a waiter, are you ready? Uh, then give me the result. Okay. So this is the second level. Yeah, I think it's, I, I, I don't know, put it at 10,000 people because essentially you already have the synchronous runtime, but now you have to hook up to an API which just arrived, your OS released one uh, you know, new API, yeah. you got some C library. Mm -hmm. And this thing just allows you to hook up to whatever you want so that you can await on chrono duration, right? Now, await this chrono question. duration, so, and it will give you the, yeah. How, okay, so that's how I can implement the thing I want to call await on. Yes. But what is the person writing the word await? What are they doing? Await, I say await on this thing. And we've talked about what that thing has to be. Yeah. But now I'm going to await on it. What does that mean? 
I, um, I, is my code suspended at that, or does that just spawn something off and I resume, or what? Uh, it is completely under the definition. Like it, it's it's whatever you want it to be, but uh, the recommendation is that this, so that uh, it makes sense to the reader of the function. So if I'm saying await five milliseconds, I I hope that it will just suspend execution for five milliseconds. But so, wait a minute. Yeah. But I've said await on this type. Uh, well, that's, I, that's I, 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 a await on the result of some computation. So if I say await on five milliseconds, the type is chrono duration, right? OK. And then there is a mapping which says, for I, I think we jumped over. There is another customization point which allows to us like uh, to make awaitable any type, like 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 chrono duration. Okay. It will give me that struct with three members that will tell me that, oh, if chrono duration is zero or less than zero, then we don't have to wait. Okay. Otherwise, subscribe to some timer that will call me back when the duration uh, expires. All okay. Right. And then what would the value then be? The value in that case is probably void. Void, right? yeah. yeah. Just waiting yeah. for that to happen. Yes, but okay. if, if, if it's somehow read from a channel, then it will be whatever you read from the channel, or maybe okay. an error. So if I were to say await on this channel or whatever I'm reading from, then I am in fact going to suspend, my code will be suspended until such time as yep. that callback happens that says now the data is here for you. Yep. But I'm not blocking. I'm just not blocked. Yes. Suspend is observed by the guy who resumed the coroutine as, as, as a return. Yeah. OK. All right. And okay. now, what's and now the third? The, oh, the third level is uh, when you want to define your own coroutine types. You want to have your own generator. You want to have your own task. Uh -huh. uh, that's where you need to go and, and understand uh, deeper. And then the, the fourth layer is to do some kind of meta programming of transforming one awaitable into another and uh, and doing funny, funny, funny things. You say that, but we'll have three talks on that at C++ now, next year, not this year. But next year, we'll have I, uh, three different yeah. people talking about how to do this. <laughs> and they'll have completely yes. different approaches. <laughs> um, speaking of which, how many talks do I want to reserve for you at CppCon in September to explain this to users? Oh, I, I think I'm done. I'm not going to talk about coroutines anymore. <laughs> oh, no. I don't want to be typecasted. Uh, I, I'm done. No, like really, I, I think I, I, I already explained everything I could about coroutines. So then now you... with the library linkage, I maybe I will be talking about you know, machine learning or whatever. Okay, but you need to work with me then to find the library people who will give those talks. It's still on you until you pass the baton. You need to successfully pass the baton. Look, we had uh, at least uh, uh, I gave first two uh, CPP cons were about coroutines uh, uh -huh. like the inner, inner details. Third one was about implementation. Fourth one was about uh, how to hook up coroutines with standard uh, with the boost as IO. So the fifth one was some unusual application I noticed uh, where people use coroutines to wait to suspend while the value is fetched from main memory to the CPU, which allows you essentially to do hyper-threading in software. So, so I, I don't think I have any, 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 <laughs> any more to say about coroutines. So, so let, me, let me ask you this. This is, a good, this is, a, this has just occurred to me. You, you've given talks then uh, at CppCon. How the, the proposal has evolved, of course. I mean, it, proposals are you know like laws and sausages. You don't want to see how they're made, that kind of thing. Um, how useful is it for someone to go back and look at your early talks at CppCon? How much has how much will they be confused because of changes uh, in terminology much. or changes? Uh, what's that? Not much. It, it is okay. mostly uh, unchanged. There were a, a few tweaks, uh, but uh, pretty much it, it, it is the same. Okay. I think 2015. So uh, starting from 2015 is what pretty much exactly what it is uh, in, in the TS. 14.1 was a tiny tweaks, different one. I think we had cancellation requested, uh, then we removed okay. it and, and put into the structure. But uh, otherwise, it's more right. strange. 15, 16, 17, and 18. Yes. Any right. 
Yes, starting we'll from links, we'll link to those. I'll, I'll dig those up, uh, Phil, and put the, and give those to you so you can put them in the show notes. Um, are there talks that you gave? I know this is shocking. Uh, you, you might even think of it. Are there talks you gave at other conferences that we should include, or does the CPPCon ones kind of? Uh, CPPCon are uh, the main ones. One. I think okay. I, I I gave uh, at CPP now, of course, and uh, a few others, but uh, they did not deliver any new information related okay. to what was at CPPCon. All right. So those four years. All right. Yes. We'll put those in the show notes, and people can get up to speed by by watching those. How's that sound, uh, Phil? Sounds good to me. Personally, I think Gore is just going to suspend doing those talks for a while, maybe even later. <laughs> this this will be the best part. It's not that he that he doesn't have to uh, he doesn't have to fight in, in the standards committee anymore to get his proposals in. It's not that he doesn't have to give any more talks on it. It's that he doesn't have to list any more puns on it. That's the big win, right, Gore? <laughs> you know. Puns only appeared after we added core underscore, right? Before there were <laughs> two right. There, there, there were fewer puns because most of was <laughs> before puns were only limited to a weight, you know, a weight on something, a weight on somebody. But uh, with core, uh, opportunity for puns is tremendous. Yes, the puns will continue until morale improves. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, there have been. Uh, I don't even want to count how many puns leading up to this talk when we announced the uh, when we announced the topic. Uh, the chat room went crazy with puns and. Uh... Well, Phil, you didn't ask any coroutine questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been suspended for a while. Yeah, I, I did have one actually, which was around. You sort of touched on it a little bit towards the end, but um, you talked a lot about generators and particularly the async tasks. But of course, you can use coroutines for some very different things as well. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? For example, um, like error handling is one use that some people have put, put it to? Uh, yes, you can. Because if you think of it, uh, expected of t is just a future which is already ready. So if coroutines give you a way to, uh, to uh, propagate the errors uh, in the nice exception we can fashion, uh, for futures, they can do the same for uh, for expected and similar types. And because one of the design goals for coroutines were uh, not to rely on exceptions, because we wanted and we have uses of coroutines in the kernel and embedded where they cannot use exceptions at all, uh, there was a way to propagate errors, uh, retaining a nice control flow so people uh, are can take advantage of it. But at the moment, uh, it is up to the compiler to make it efficient. So by construction, mm. it, it, it's not necessarily efficient. Uh, talking of efficiency, I know that's one of the things that uh, the held things up a bit during the standardization process was concerns about guaranteed efficiency, particularly in terms of uh, uh, heap allocation mm -hmm. and when the compiler can elide that uh, or whether it's guaranteed to be able to elide that. Yes, is uh, there is absolutely no guarantees uh, with regard to that. So I right. think if we want, well, I mean, uh, there is a guarantee. Uh, you can just uh, delete, or you know, you, you can. Uh, uh, you do not provide operator new and operator delete. You just declare them and add semicolon. So you have a guarantee that your code will not compile okay. if 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 uh, if compiler is calling those functions. Uh, so that like that's the only way to guarantee, but it is a quality of implementation, right? Standard right. does not give you the rules under which there will be no heap allocation for the coroutine state. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that it will not happen in the future, because we uh, gave a very nice and lightweight syntax for coroutines, but as you probably observed during the committee, everybody wants, including myself, to get an inner coroutine artifact as a struct with which I want to play. And uh, once we figure out what it is, we, sh we shall get it. It's just that we don't yet have the one that everybody likes it equally. Because we had, over the last five years, we had five or six versions of what that thing might look like. Right. And I don't think we, we converged yet on what it is. So yes, we will get a guaranteed no heap allocation 
coroutine artifact as a struct in the future, uh, but not right now. Right now, you just rely on the compilers. And if you're really desperate, uh, just put semicolon at the end of the your uh, operator new and operator delete. Uh, Which, what you're saying is declare declare your own operator new and delete without implementing them. Yes. So that, uh, so uh, that at link time, the compiler yes. is, is going to be fine with it. But at link time, your linker is going to say, you forgot something. And you will not you will not be in a situation where you're producing embedded code that will, in fact, try to allocate. Yes. You can prevent that from happening. You can prevent that. Yeah. Uh, you can't actually make the compiler implement it in such a way that it doesn't call. But you can guarantee that you won't ship something that does call an allocation. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yes. Uh, very clever. All right. Um, Phil, I know you're trying to rest your voice a bit, but do you have any other questions? Um, no, I think that's that's about it for today. All right. Um, I, I want to thank you, Gore, uh, and uh, I, I appreciate you sharing this with us. I've I've learned a lot because coroutines is the thing that at the high level um, I've kind of understood and, and great, but every time we try to dig down, uh, I get, always get overwhelmed by the details, and I feel like this time I, I have a better. I don't think I've completely grasped all the details, but I have a better understanding of what's going on a little bit lower level. I don't think I'm at the very lowest level yet, but I'm I'm from the 2 million users to the 10,000 users. I'm starting to understand at the 10,000 user level. And uh, But first level good. is good enough for everybody. It's only when you when you need something special, you have to deep, deep deeper. I understand that. I understand that. But when you want to explain to the 2 million, you kind of have to understand the, the bigger yourself. And so that's and that's my job is to explain things. So oh. I've, I've always felt yeah. like I couldn't explain coroutines because I didn't know it quite deep enough. And so you've, I'm still not there, but I'm but I feel I feel better about it. So. Um, Good. Uh, so it's been great having you on. And um, so what is the next step for you? You're, you, you, you're, you're dusting coroutines off your hands. Are you, uh, is there another language feature that you're wanting to Not champion? yet. I think right now we need to make sure that uh, coroutines are having enough support in the ecosystem so that people can take advantage of it. So I'll, I'll be involved a little bit more with coroutines, not necessarily on the language side, but more on the library side. That's terrific. That is terrific. That's what I want to see. Yeah, lots of lots of support for it. And I don't think we're ready to put that in the standard yet. I want to see some trial and error and experimentation and uh, talks at C++ now. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Maybe next time. Not, 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 not this now. Yeah, not this time. OK, well, thank you very much. I thank and, you very uh, much. It was a great I, to be with I, you. I want you to uh, join us in wishing everybody safe coding, um, because uh, um, there's safe uh, coding. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pike with uh, C plus plus twenty. So safe coding, everybody. Safe, safe coding. coding, everybody. <laughs>